Now before we start looking at electromagnetism, let's just think about normal magnetism. So this is a bar magnet, it's got a north pole and a south pole, and there's a region surrounding this where a force acts on other magnets or maybe magnetic materials. And we can see that if we put this other magnet over here, something's going to happen, and it's the south end which is attracted to the north. So when you have unlike poles, they attract. If the two poles are the same, they repel. Now for this magnet, the strongest field is going to be at the poles. And we can actually plot this using a small plotting compass where when you put it on the table, you can see which way it lines up and then you can uh, actually then start to draw the field lines. But the field lines look a bit like this. So that's just a rough sketch. It's supposed to be symmetrical and the field lines go from north to south. So I'm just gonna put some arrows on the diagram to show that. So this is the magnetic field around a simple bar magnet. Now this is also the shape of the magnetic field around the Earth. And this is the reason why if you have a compass, if you're navigating, it always points to north. So the evidence that uh, we have this magnetic iron core in the centre of the Earth is because of the magnetic field that we can experience and actually detect every day. But something really happens if you have a piece of wire and you connect it into a circuit so that there's a current flowing. What we then have is what we call an induced magnet. So just by having a current flowing in a conductor, we then have a magnetic field. Now, if we have a conductor like this, which is just um, a wire, then if we actually start to look at the field lines, so maybe we've got the current flowing in this direction. I'm just going to draw the field lines in green. What we have are these concentric circles that get more and more widely spaced as we actually draw that. And we can actually think about the direction of this by using our right hand rule. So if this is the direction of the current with my thumb, then my, my fingers point in the direction that that field is going. So we have the field lines um, like this. So I've just got an arrow to show the direction of that field. Now the thing is, if we had more wires, then we'd have a stronger magnetic field. And actually, if we had it coiled round into a coil like this, we'd have an even stronger magnetic field. Now this coil of wire here, it, which uh, is a coil of wire that can carry a current, is called a solenoid. And if I was to draw a solenoid a bit like this, I could then draw the magnetic field lines through it. And actually what we find is in the middle, we have these lines which are really close together, uh, like this. And they also come around the side like that. In actual fact, this is the same shape as we have around a permanent magnet over here. But in the middle we have this, uh, this dense uh, magnetic field where all the field lines are really close together. Again, these can go from north to south. And so in a solenoid, what this behaves is when you put a current through it, this behaves a bit like a bar magnet. And that's incredibly useful for all sorts of devices. Now when you have a current and it's moving, this then causes there to be a magnetic field. And these three things are really closely linked to one another. So you have a current flowing, so there's a movement of electrons inside a wire, we cause a magnetic field. But what would happen if we had a magnetic field and a current flowed in that? What you then get is the third side of the triangle, you get the movement. And this is called the motor effect. So the motor effect is put to good use in motors. What we have inside this motor here is we have some permanent magnets. When the current starts to flow, we then get movement. And we can actually use something called Fleming's left-hand rule. Now for this, my first finger tells me the direction of the magnetic field. Now a magnetic field, we actually give the symbol B2. My second finger tells me the direction of conventional current. And my first finger tells me the direction of the force that a conductor is going to experience and therefore the direction it moves. So we can see that we've got from this triangle over here, we've got magnetic field, we've got current, and then my thumb is the force or the direction of that movement. So these three things are really closely linked. Now what this means is if you had just a single wire in a magnetic field, we could predict which way it's moving. So let's imagine we had the north end and the south end of a magnet uh, like this. Uh, between the two of them, there's going to be a region where we have a magnetic field. I'm going to draw this in because we know that the magnetic field goes from north to south. Now this wire here is effectively coming out of the paper towards you. I've just drawn that with a dot. We can then use Fleming's left-hand rule to predict which way that wire would move. So first of all, my first finger is a magnetic field going from north to south like this. 
my second finger is a current, which is coming out of the paper. It's pretty awkward to do this. And my thumb is pointing up. So what we'd have here is the wire would move in this direction. Obviously, we could turn that wire to go downwards by either reversing the direction of the magnets or we could reverse the direction of that current. So effectively, what we're doing there is if we were to reverse the direction of the magnets, magnetic field, this would happen and my thumb would point down. Really awkward to do. If you're in an exam and you see people starting to do this, there's probably a question about the motor effect and Fleming's left hand rule. But how does a motor work? Well, effectively, what you have is you've got a coil of wire and some of the wire is coming, uh, some of the current flows towards you, some of that current is flowing the other way. And what you then have is as soon as you pass a current, um, basically the piece of wire, some of it moves up, some of it moves down. And then you can use a thing called a split ring and that allows you to then have electric current flowing always in the same direction inside that motor. We can also use an equation to do some calculations and we can actually look at the size of the force on that conductor and F is equal to B I L where we measure our force in newtons, we measure our magnetic field in the Tesla like the car, uh, current in amps and length in meters. Now it's not just motors that use the motor effect, we can also use it in loudspeakers. Now in a loudspeaker you might have a very small circular magnet like this, okay, and this is connected to maybe a large paper or cardboard cone. Okay, so you've got your magnet at the bottom. What you then do is you have a coil of wire that comes in and it goes around this several times. Okay, now what happens is that if you have a current flowing in one direction, you've got a current flowing, you've got a magnetic field in this permanent magnet down here. And what that means is that maybe when the current flows this way, the thing here moves up. If you then have the current flowing in the other direction, it moves down. And by varying very quickly which way the current is flowing, uh, that causes the speaker to move up and down, which then causes a load of sound waves to be radiated from this. But this doesn't have to just be a motor. If we think about maybe moving uh, this thing inside a magnetic field, what we're now doing is we are using this as a generator. So by moving this conductor inside a magnetic field, we induce a potential difference and therefore we induce a current. So a motor and a generator are very, very similar. Again, all we're doing now is completing, I guess, the other side of that triangle. So we can also think about the generator effect. So with the generator effect, if a conductor moves relative to a magnetic field, or the magnetic field around uh, a conductor changes, then we induce a potential difference across the ends of the conductor. And this is the, if this is then part of a complete circuit, we then have a current that flows. So how do you make this effect bigger? How do we get more electricity out of our generators? Well, one thing we can do is we can increase the size of the magnetic field. So you make the magnetic field bigger, um, it's going to cause a bigger voltage. You can also make it move quicker. So V is our velocity here, or speed. So we can move something quicker. And also we can have, if you had maybe a, a coil of wire which is turning inside the magnetic field, what you can do is you can have more turns. So this solenoid here has one coil of wire, but the amount of time that it goes round gives us a number of turns. So if you have more turns on the generator, that's going to cause there to be a bigger um, induced potential difference. Now generators are really two sorts. We have things which are AC, so alternating current, and this is called an alternator. But you can also have ones which give a DC supply, uh, and this is called a dynamo. And if we were to look at the output voltage with time, what we'd see is for an alternator, you'd get something that looks like this. Now, if you were to spin it quicker or you had a bigger magnetic field, what we'd then have is a higher voltage, but if it was spinning quicker, then we'd have more cycles per second. And the last thing we're going to look at is the transformer. Now, a transformer is really useful in the national grid because what it does is it allows us to change the current and potential difference in a different part of a circuit. Now, what we have here, this is our normal transformer. We have a primary coil, and we have a secondary coil. So if this is where the electricity is uh, maybe starting, this is our primary coil, it's got a number of turns, and there's a different number of turns on the secondary coil. So what happens is, is that when you have an alternating current in this wire, 
This causes there to be an alternating magnetic field, like we saw with the solenoid up here, inside this iron core. So this iron core then becomes magnetised. And what we have is the, is the magnetic field moves this way and then moves that way. What we then have is this iron core transmits that magnetic field to the secondary core. So inside this coil of wire, we then have a changing magnetic field. If you've got a changing magnetic field, um, which is uh, effectively that that magnetic field is moving, we then induce a potential difference. So we then have a potential difference in the secondary coil which causes a current to flow. So that is the kind of bog standard average transformer that you need to know about for GCSE. So with this we can think about the potential difference in the primary uh, coil, we can think about the current in the primary coil and also the number of turns on the primary coil and obviously we can do the same for the secondary. And what we find is that the potential difference increases um, in proportion to the number of turns from the primary to the secondary. So what we can say is that Vp over Vs is equal to Np over Ns. So imagine that had 5 turns and that had 10 turns. That means you might go from 5 volts to 10 volts. But when you increase that potential difference, we reduce the current. And the other equation we can say is that Vp IP is equal to Vs Is. So the, this is effectively power, remembering that power is equal to potential difference times current. If you've got um, a power coming in, it's the same as the power going out, and that means that the initial power on the primary coil is the same as the power on the secondary coil. Now on a step-up transformer, it steps up the potential difference, so that means there's a bigger number of turns on the secondary coil than the primary. If, however, you had a step-down transformer, you'd have a bigger number of turns on the primary than on the secondary. And what you have in the national grid is that you step up the potential difference uh, when you leave the power station, so it's thousands and thousands of volts, and then you step it back down, back down to eventually 230 volts for use in our homes. So that is a summary of AQA electromagnetism. It can get a little bit tricky at times. If you want to find out more detail about anything in this video, there will be videos at gcsephysicsonline.com.